I like getting to worship with you. There are days where um, I could just keep worshiping, but I have to get up and preach. And today was one of those days. So um, if you were to participate in the procreation of the species, um, you would likely hit a phase with one of your children, or probably all of them, that I would just call the I know phase. Uh, maybe you've already been there. This is the phase where while your kid cannot master the task of picking the towel up off the bathroom floor, they have apparently gained the power to read minds. Because before the words even finish coming out of your mouth as a parent, you hear them say, I know, Dad, or I know, Mom. Chloe, would you? I know. Chloe, I just want to remind you, I know. It's amazing what they know. Here's the thing. Sometimes they know. Sometimes they don't know. Sometimes they know, but they don't do. Other times they know and do, but the thing about which you're reminding them is of such great importance that you're like, I'm going to keep reminding them anyway. Well, welcome again to our gathering. If you're new, my name is Connor Neigenfeind. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here. And we have been in a series on the book of 2 Peter. It is a short book. This is only week two. So if you're new, you're jumping in still towards the beginning of this short series. And we are picking up in 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. You're free to read from any of the good ones. All right, here we go. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things. Even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth, you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I'm gone. It's like I, Peter, am reminding you Christians of that which you already know and of that which you're already standing firm in, but I'm going to keep reminding you over and over again as long as there is air in my lungs because that which I am reminding you of, I want you to remember after I am gone. It's like, this is so important for me that you all understand these things and are reminded of them. I'm just gonna keep reminding Reminding you as long as I possibly can. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, would say something similar. He would write this while he was in prison. He would say, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. There is this theme of repetition in the Bible. There is this theme, even of the Old Testament, of remember, remember. And then when we get to the New Testament, we hear apostles, we read of apostles writing, I'm just gonna tell you the same thing. I'm gonna remind you about this again. There is this theme of repetition. And some of you are new and some of you have um, been coming to Edgewater Alliance for some time, but I'll, I'll kind of clue you in on maybe an obvious secret. Um, mostly what I do most of the time when I'm preaching is say the same things over and over and over again. Now, I repackage them. I, I try not to bore you. I try to present them in fresh ways, but almost every week, if you haven't caught on, it's some variation of, hey, let's be faithful to Jesus. Let's follow after Jesus. Let's not be jerks. And for the literal love of God, let's do something meaningful and missional with our lives. Like that's every week. And yet you all keep coming, you know? And and I still have a job, and 
I, I think, I th yes, yeah, it's good. Um, I'm glad I have a job too. Uh, no, I understand. And, and, here's, and here's the reality. If every week you came and it was something new, I would probably be a heretic, right? New often equals untrue. If you're going to a church and you're hearing stuff that no one's ever heard before, it's likely stuff that isn't true. New is often untrue. Um, but we need reminders. We do. And I like really honest song lyrics. I, I think sometimes um, Christian music is like an exaggeration. Sometimes it's like not always feels like it's being 100% authentic, but I love lines that just really feel gritty and like they're speaking truth. You find that in some of the new Christian music and you also find it in some of the old Christian music. But the hymn, Come Thou Fount, my favorite line in the whole hymn, it's a depressing one, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That made a hymn. And I don't know if you relate to that in any way, but as one of your pastors, I would just say I do. There is this pull, this gravitational force in our world that seems to pull us away from the pursuit of Jesus and to the pursuit of our own desires and the things that we think will make us happy. There's a gravitational pull away from pursuing the kingdom of God to pursuing our own kingdom. There's a gravitational pull away from, from pursuing purity and pursuing pleasure in ways that we shouldn't. There's a focus, a pull from us to, to not be generous with our finances, but to be greedy with our finances. There's just this pull. And if, I, and if you're not experiencing it, good on you. You probably will soon. And so the need for constant and frequent reminders. May we not be the kids who when we're being reminded of that which is good, noble, right, and true, just shut off our brains, start looking at football scores and go, I know I've heard that story before. I've learned that before. It's not about whether you've learned it before per se. It's about are you leaning into it? Are you living it? Are you being reminded of it? Are you safeguarding your mind from it so that you don't drift, so that you don't give in to the gravitational pull? I need reminders frequently in my faith. Some of the most meaningful things for you and for me is not learning things that are new. And sometimes we will. And obviously there are things that all of us can continue to learn and grow in and know. But often what we need the most is simply to be reminded of that which we have already learned. The text continues in verse 16. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, quote, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And in verse 18, he says this, we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Some of you don't know what he's talking about there at all. Maybe some of you need a reminder. We covered this in the Life of Peter series, but let me just read you the account of the transfiguration from Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse one, because this is what is being referenced here in 2 Peter. This is what it says. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. 
Peter exclaimed, Lord, it is wonderful us, for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, quote, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus said, then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone and they saw only Jesus. The account tells of an experience that Peter had, not alone, but also with James and John, where he got to witness the majesty of Jesus. And then when they look up, the prophets are gone, and they see Jesus alone. If that experience happened to you, I would imagine it would be a transformative one. And Peter is very much sticking to the story as we read in 2 Peter, and that is being referenced in 2 Peter. And he's saying, he's in the context of, I'm reminding you, well, what is he, being re what is he reminding the readers of? I believe what is happening here in a, in a sense is, I'm wanting to remind you of the veracity of your faith, that what you believe is rooted and grounded in reality, that me and the other apostles are not making up clever stories to just teach you moral principles or to gain some level of power. Like this experience on, on, at the transfiguration was true. It happened to me, not only to me, but also to uh, James and John. And, and what I am telling you is rooted in fact, that it is not a myth. In fact, the Greek word that was used to, for the phrase uh, in verse 16, for we were not making up clever stories, clever stories comes from the Greek word mythoi, and PhD Douglas Moo comments this in his commentary. He says, mythoi, literally myths. This word was used in a wide variety of ways in the ancient world, but the meaning that best fits the context is fictional account, fable. The mythos was often viewed as a mechanism to teach religious truth to people who did not have the intellectual capacity to apprehend matters of the spirit directly. He continues, Aristotle comments, the mythical form is chosen to make apprehension possible for the masses for their religious and ethical instruction. We can assume that the false teachers are claiming that the idea of Jesus' return in glory was just such a mythos, a religious story to encourage, quote, ordinary Christians. If you're tracking with it, what he's commentating on is he's saying that Peter is going after the cultural idea in the day that was probably being propagated by false teachers as we believe it is in our day that, hey, just so you know, that stuff about Jesus, that's just a myth. It's just a story. It's just to help simple minds kind of understand some lessons about the divine and maybe morality. And Peter, in this letter, what we find is the author notes, no, that is not what's going on. This is true. This is real. This isn't a myth. I have experiences that prove it. And so that seems to be what he is going after. That is something that he is wanting to remind the readers of. And the ESV study Bible would strongly state this, that the gospel of Christ was no myth because the apostles were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter has observed the majesty of Christ firsthand at the transfiguration. He knew that Christ had come in power. He was no mere literary character invented for a mythological narrative. That the case for Christianity, as it has been called by Lee Strobel, 
has been grounded in historical eyewitness accounts and that we must do something with that if we are going to merely argue that it is a myth. No one is claiming these are stories that did not take place and people on the outside are leaning in and critiquing this is what it is and the apostles are like, no, I've seen it with my own eyes. And maybe you too have had experiences that you can't explain away except for Jesus. And we believe that Jesus is alive, that he's moving, and that people have experiences with him still. Amen? Chapter one concludes in this way. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence. It's like we had it before, but we have even more confidence now. And sometimes that's how it works in the Christian life, right? That we, we do believe, but, but then there's things that happen in our lives and they, and they encourage us in our faith. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the messages proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ, the morning star, shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. It's like these guys weren't just shooting from the hip. They weren't making stuff up. They weren't just adding their thoughts. No. These prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Renowned biblical scholar N.T. Wright would write this on this passage. The results of this eyewitness testimony is that the apostles could look back on the entire world of biblical prophecy, that great, untidy, all over the place story which functioned all through as a set of signposts pointing forward to what was to come. And could see that in retrospect, it all made sense. What Peter is saying then is that the stories of Jesus reaching something of a climax in the extraordinary revelation of glory at the transfiguration meant that one can now read the entire ancient Jewish scriptures knowing the end from the beginning and can see with God-given hindsight how everything came rushing together at the point where the Messiah himself emerged. Jesus, his coming, transfiguration, death and resurrection has confirmed the prophetic words of scripture. And we hold on to these like people clinging to a bright lamp through the darkest time of the night until the day when Jesus reappears at last as the morning star, ready to usher in God's final great day. So the text tells us, we read clearly that it's good for us to be reminded of things that we have heard before. And what the text then goes on to remind its readers of is, hey, just to remind you, you're already, they've already read, you're standing firm. I'm not telling you something you don't know, but there might be a lot of noise out there. And I want to remind you that what you believe about Jesus and his coming back, it's true. It's not myth. It's based in fact, eyewitness accounts of the majesty of Jesus. And not only that, it increased the confidence we have of the prophetic writings of the Old Testament. And so, if that's true, then we as followers of Jesus would do well then to lean in deeply in our understanding and knowledge of the scriptures. That what we have here is of utmost importance, that we we want to grow, we want to learn, we want to study, we want to be reading. And then as a result of that, 
and by the grace of God as we read that we are not alone and that the Holy Spirit is with us, that God says the Holy Spirit is, is with us and in us, and, and Paul would write that he is at work in you both to will and to work to his good pleasure, that then we spend the rest of our lives living in light of what we read and have studied and have come to believe, that we live in light of what we read about as the return of Jesus. And really, the question then becomes, If you believe all of that, what could possibly be a better investment of your life? What could possibly be worth pursuing more? What do you have more important to do than apprentice under Jesus? If you're able at this time, I'd like to invite you to stand for a benediction. So Edgewater Alliance Church, May we be a community that clings to what has been passed down to us, not merely as myth, not merely as legend, not merely as moral teaching, but as genuine prophetic and apostolic writings. May we continue to remind one another, not just somebody from a stage, but you all together around your living rooms, in your neighborhoods, would you remind one another of that which is true, of that which is good, of that which is noble, of that which is right, because we need reminders so that we can walk the path of Jesus more passionately and more faithfully. Not abandoning it or veering to the right or to the left, which is so easy to do, but clinging to its words is truth, believing that Christ is coming back, and that you and I have the privilege of living as missionaries until he returns. I love you, EAC. Go be the church. Blessings.